Hello. Hi, this is Ben Llewellyn. Today I'm talking about Sir William Jones, a linguist from the 18th century, a Welsh linguist who revolutionized how we view languages and how they relate to each other and laid the groundwork for comparative linguistics. How did he do this? Well, that's what the video is about, so let's jump right into it. Sir William Jones was the son of William Jones from Ulus Mon. Yes, they both had the same name, quite a Welsh way of doing it. And William Jones, the father that is, was the first to use the pi symbol in mathematics and Vice President of the Royal Society, a prestigious society for scientific knowledge. Not bad. So young William Jones was born into a talented family. And he was born in 1746 in Westminster, London. Wait, didn't I just say he was Welsh? How do you define Welsh? How do you define nationality? Let me know down in the comments. And I mean, I'm Welsh and Texan. I'm an American citizen, but I'm a British subject. How does that work? Sir William Jones was not just a singular nationality. He was Anglo, but he was staunchly Welsh. And his Welsh wife. And I don't care who you are, if you keep the Welsh language outside of Wales, you are Welsh. That is such a cultural emblem and powerhouse. You cannot defeat that. And Sir William Jones clearly did so. He also, as we will see later on in this video, he had some rather Welsh political beliefs, which were looked down upon in his age by his English contemporaries. We know he spoke Welsh, but he grew up in upper class English society, being sent to the school of Harrow. As a boy, he was a linguistic prodigy. The headmaster of Harrow was heard to say that Jones knew more Greek than himself, and a schoolfellow later wrote that he imitated the writings of Sophocles so well that his own writings seemed to be original Greek compositions. Whilst at Harrow, he learned French and Italian, and during his holy days, he began Hebrew and the Arabic. Later, after Sir William Jones's death, his friend Lord Tainmouth wrote that he had studied eight languages critically, which seems to mean fluent, I think. Welsh, Latin, French, Italian, Greek, Arabic, Persian, Sanskrit, another eight less fluent, but still fine in Spanish, Portuguese, German, runic, which I'm not really sure what that is. If you know what that is, let me know down below. Maybe that's kind of like Nordic Viking runes. I doubt it because his interests were elsewhere, but you never know. Hebrew, Bengali, Turkish, and another 12, which he studied to an attainable level. I guess that means he was able to read them, including Coptic, basically ancient Egyptian, Dutch, Tibetan, which has the sound found in Welsh, by the way, and Chinese, which he translated at least twice into Western languages. So quite a lot. This was pre-internet, by the way, huh? I mean, that's not easy without Google Translate. In 1764, he was matriculated at Oxford and was granted a scholarship. He was so well-versed in Latin and Greek, his lectures were not of much interest to him. So, in private, he read classical languages, as well as French, Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. I mean, if you read several languages, because classical Greek at Oxford is not difficult enough for you, well... Three years later, he began German. And he also began Persian and the spoken Arabic with a friend. In Persian language, he seems to be self-taught. How you teach yourself Persian in 1768, I don't know. There weren't exactly a lot of 
dictionaries for Persian laying around were there. And it would have been difficult enough to learn languages like Polish, Norwegian, or Welsh next door just to find dictionaries in those languages. To learn Persian on your own in 1768. He published his first book in 1770, a Persian translation into French, which had been requested by the King of Denmark, Christian VII, a learned man. The book was The Life of Nader Shah. Jones published further books, translating Persian into English and Latin by 1774, by which time he was likely the leading Orientalist in Britain. During this time, he used the nom de plume. His writing name, Jones Uxfardi, Jones of Oxford, which is quite ostentatious to say of all the Jones who went to Oxford, knowing that in this age, it was the university that the Welsh went to, that this was the Jones of Oxford. And it's quite a Welsh way of saying it as well. Welsh have a bit of swagger and style. In 1772, he was made a fellow of the Royal Society and in 1773, a member of the Literary Club. A uh, quite posh affair, a gentleman's dining club in London. Late nights with socialites, bourgeois company. Becoming president in 1780. And he amassed letters after his name for these societies. Quite a high society type man. And in this time he became well acquainted with leading thinkers of the day like Burke and Gibbon. As well as taking up the gentlemanly art of fencing. He was a man of distinguished sensibilities. However, for financial reasons, he took up the law profession and was called to the Middle Temple in 1774. An old way of saying he became a barrister. In 1778, he had been a candidate for judgeship in Calcutta. But his open disapproval of the American War made the British administration unwilling to appoint him. Which is a good time to mention his politics and his Welsh wife. A Calcutta barrister wrote of him in 1791, later on, when the French Revolution shook the British establishment with fear. He said, the flame of liberty burns very ardently in his mind, that's Jones, and it has, I fear, consumed everything monarchical and aristocratical it found there. But I love and respect him for his benevolence and genius. He lived during the times and the age of the French and American revolutions and criticized the British state in these wars. A dangerous thing to do in the Georgian age in Britain if you valued your life. The Britain of George III was feverishly xenophobic and continuously suspect of dissent. Paranoid. He was a circuit judge in Wales and then became involved in politics. He met with Benjamin Franklin in Paris perhaps merely to extend the great minds that he knew, but he there tried to resolve the American War, which did not exactly work. Sir William Jones ran to be a member of Parliament for Oxford in 1780, but he lost. He was perhaps too radical, being friendly with the colonial rebels. Newly wed in 1783, his pamphlet called The Principles of Government in a Dialogue Between a Scholar and a Peasant was the subject of a court trial for seditious libel. Sedition was a byword of the day. This court trial came after his pamphlet was reprinted by his new brother-in-law, the Dean of Hinelwi, William Davies Shipley. In this work, Jones noted the defects of the electoral system and suggested democratic reforms. William Davies Shipley reprinted it. Sir Thomas Fitzmaurice, the brother of the Prime Minister, Earl of Shelbourne, indicted Shipley in court for publishing material the government took offence to. You can see this period in British history was one in which the British state feared the people might overthrow the aristocracy. 
And so to everyone's surprise when the corrupt Prime Minister's brother lost the case, Jones's brother-in-law outside was met with fireworks, congratulation, bonfires, and celebration. Sir William Jones gained his knighthood in 1783, likely helping him overcome his reputation for unorthodox political ideas. And so he was allowed the post he had been refused before in India. But not before marrying Anna Shipley, the daughter of the Bishop of Llanelwy, not to be confused with Dean. Posts of power and influence in the day were clearly kept in the family. And even if she was the daughter of an Englishman, her having grown up in Wales, in an area that was nearly all Welsh speaking at the time, is quite Welsh. And in 1784, in Calcutta, he did something very important. He founded the Asiatic Society, later renamed the Asiatic Society of Bengal, and became its president, a post he held for the rest of his life, so that is quite significant. He immediately set out extensive studies of Sanskrit, the classical language of India and Hindu laws, what Latin is to our liberal Western civilization. Sanskrit is to India, yeah? He was the first to translate Sakuntala, the greatest work of Indian dramatic literature, into a Western language. It was quickly translated into German, which was a hit in Germany. He was the first European to print the text of any Sanskrit work. Our knowledge of both Indian and Persian, for that matter, language and literature, without him could have taken a century to catch up with what he and the monumental work of the society he founded left behind. In India, he was conspicuous for the kindness and human attitude and even respect he had for Indians. The British did not see the Indian natives as equals, and, and his kindness towards them was a peculiar behavior, and it was noted. This goes to show if you study a people's language, their culture, just that in itself plants the seed of respect for them and humility towards them in you. And this fusion of cultural kindness, humility, linguistics and botany. He may have grown up in England, but that combination of traits is quite Welsh culturally. Sir William Jones began a compilation of codified Hindu laws, which helped the British rule India. Let's not fool ourselves into thinking that the Welsh of the age were in any great number disloyal to the empire. Codifying the Hindu laws was a British imperial project and of great assistance to governing and ruling over the natives. He also wrote on Indian music, chess, and the lunar calendar of Hindus. He published works on Indian botany, or the study of India's plants. He even had a tree named after him. He translated a flurry of Sanskrit and Oriental writings not bad for only nine years in India, but his greatest contribution by far was linguistics. I wonder if Sir William Jones had mango juice in India. This stuff is lovely. In a speech before the Asiatic Society on the 2nd of February, 1786, Sir William Jones gave a groundbreaking speech which changed linguistics forever, and in it he laid down the foundations of comparative linguistics and what would eventually become the study of Indo-European languages. And this is what he had to say. The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either. 
yet bearing to both of them a stranger affinity, both in the roots of verbs and the forms of grammar, than could possibly have been produced by accident, so strong indeed that no philologer could examine them all three without believing them to be have sprung from some common source which, perhaps, no longer exists. There is a similar reason, though not quite so forcible, for supposing that both the Gothic and the Celtic, though blended with a very different idiom, had the same origin with the Sanskrit, and the Old Persian might be added to the same family. As happened with so many Northern Europeans in India, the climate began to harm Sir William Jones's health, and before he could make it back to Britain, he succumbed to illness and died. Even though he died early, if he had died a decade earlier, he would never have even seen India, and the groundwork for Indo-European linguistics would not have been laid, nor would we have his Royal Society devoted to the study of Oriental literature which has expanded our knowledge and continues to do so to this day. Not long after him, a Danish linguist named Rasmus Rask journeyed to India and took over where Sir William Jones left off, beginning the reconstruction of a proto-Indo-European language, linking the languages of Northern India with Persian and especially his work in Germanic languages which reached all the way up into Icelandic, Old English, and into the Latin Romance roots and the Slavic. Finding bridges between all of these languages we now know today come from the same source. And this would have been impossible without Jones's work. That being able to see the difference, or the correlation, rather, between those different languages, and liking languages from an early age, and being finally attuned to them, I think, stems from the fact that Sir William Jones lost his father, clearly very Welsh and adamant for the Welsh language, at an early age, when he was just three. And though he was raised within a Welsh family and obviously had very close connections with them, having gone back to Wales at various points in his life, I think that fondness and closeness to the Welsh language, combined with that loss at an early age, fused into an affinity for language itself that never left him. And in a way, it's a testimony to the value of the Welsh language, because it sprouted in him this intense and tenacious curiosity for language itself, which led to a life of such fruitful work, though cut tragically short, but also I just wanted you to see how this brief life influenced linguistics to such an extent. It's worth taking a look at, I think. Let me down in the comments below, what did you think of that man's life? And as always, Diolch and William, thank you very much for watching, we will see you next time.